Azim. Yes. How does this, <laughs> does it matter if, if free will exists or if we just believe it exists? Yeah, so that's the question that I've been thinking about for the past few years. You know, when I told people that I was doing this panel, every time I told somebody I was doing this panel, the very first question was, oh, well, does free will exist? And every time I dodged the question, and I'm going to continue <laughs> to dodge the question throughout this okay. session, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to address your question. Um, does it matter? What happens if everybody believes, Christoph, that we don't have free will, uh, and we live in a world where unbelief in free will reigns supreme and that affects our behaviors and thoughts. Is it going to affect them? In other words, what does a world, uh, a post-free will belief world look like? Uh, and I think it's an important question because scientific ideas like this one uh, have a tendency to percolate out into public consciousness and then affect how people act and, and treat each other. And a lot of theorists have worried about this particular one because they worry that if we don't believe in free will, that's going to lead to some sort of moral breakdown. That free will goes, and then moral accountability goes, and then we descend into some lawless dystopia. Um, alternatively, there's an, a number of other theorists who are more optimistic about this, which is that, no, uh, it's not going to lead to this dystopia. Instead, if we give up the idea of free will, we're also going to give up our, our often destructive attachments to concepts like ambition and retribution. And so what a number of uh, my social psychology colleagues and I have been testing is we've brought people into the lab and experimentally manipulated their free will beliefs, um, which sounds really sinister, but really what it is is it's just bringing people in and exposing them to these types of arguments uh, that free will does not exist and then measuring their behavior. And so uh, one of the earliest studies on this was done by Kathleen Vaz and Jonathan Schooler, and what they showed is, well, if people are disabused of that idea of free will, if they're told free will does not exist, then compared to a group whose free will beliefs were disturbed, whether they were going to cheat more. Okay. And they did this by giving them uh, a math test, and a math test that was really annoying, and it made you really uh, uh, tempted to cheat on the test. And what they found is that the people who were told that free will doesn't exist, they showed much higher rates of cheating, and the, uh, the less you believed in free, free will, the more you ended up cheating. And a second study uh, looked, instead of cheating, it looked at stealing, and you found the same thing. So people who were told that free will doesn't exist, they stole more from the experiment. Uh, a third study, um, which was done by other researchers, looked at aggression. So if it's the same thing, if you feel like you're not morally accountable for your actions, then why don't you aggress against somebody that you don't like? And social psychologists have this kind of strange way of measuring aggression in the lab. We can't bring participants in and actually have them hurt each other in any serious way. And so what we do is we, we bring two participants in and we make them dislike each other. And then we give <laughs> one of them the opportunity to spike the other one's food with hot sauce. Uh, <laughs> And they know that the other person does not like spicy food. So in this case, hot sauce is used as a weapon of aggression. And as you would expect, at this point, uh, the, the people who were uh, told that free will doesn't exist, they used about twice as much hot sauce. So they, they really uh, gave in to their desires to aggress in this case, because why not? Um, now, those experiments, they give uh, some credence to these, these dystopian fears that maybe we're going to see a moral breakdown. But there are some other arguably positive benefits, and these are particularly in the realm of punishment, right? So if holding yourself less morally responsible for your actions leads us to engage in moral behavior, well, maybe then holding other people less morally responsible is going to reduce our emphasis on retribution, on the type of punishment where we're just looking to make other people suffer for the transgressions that they've caused, and maybe it'll make us focus more on the punishment that actually has a social benefit, that has a, a utilitarian advantage in terms of making people, uh, deterring other people from committing crimes or rehabilitating people.